everyone, here we are, uh, Sunday the 15th of October, in the middle of another month, and a uh, nice morning, but it's very cold, I had to get a body warmer this morning, to keep things warm a wee bit, but it's lovely clear morning, blue sky, slight frost this morning, and we're getting into that time of the year, so we can't help it, so welcome again, thank me, thank you for allowing me into your homes and your families, and those guys on the roads as well, that uh, listen in uh, every Sunday morning or get it at the beginning of the week. So we trust that the Lord will bless his word as we look at it. Our subject this morning and probably for another Sunday morning as well is quite involved. It's the judgment seat of Christ or the seat of review. So we'll look at it and we'll take as the great basis, foundation verse in the book of the Revelation and chapter 22 and verse 12, Revelation 22, 12 and 13, <clears throat> it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. To give my reward is with me, the Lord said, to give every man according as his work shall be. Now just a couple of other verses, just and we'll be looking at some different scriptures as we go through this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 deals with the subject as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 10. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 there says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And the other scripture that Deals with it is in Romans chapter 14 and verse number 10. And it says there, Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why, do, why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now the Lord give us good understanding of these scriptures and we'll look at some others probably as we go through this morning. <clears throat> Just gone half past eight. We'll see how we get on with our subject this morning. <coughs> Let me say first of all that um, there is no such a thing in our Bible as a general judgment. I be amazed sometimes and used to go through the schools quite a lot in earlier days and uh, was quite surprised often times about those who believed, and even teachers who believed in sort of a general judgment, that at the end of time that God would do some great balancing act and put all the good deeds on this side and all the bad deeds on this side. Now, the, the scripture's foreign to an idea like that. There is no such a thing in our Bible as a general judgment. In fact, there are many, many judgments. If it was our subject this morning to look at the great age periods. There are seven great age periods. The scholars call them dispensations. A dispensation is just an age period. And God in his manifold wisdom has ordained seven great age periods. And we live, of course, in the sixth great age period, the age of grace, just one more to go, the great millennial kingdom. But you would find if you study those dispensations, those age periods, that after each of the age periods is a judgment. So there are many judgments. Many judgments in our Bible. Of course, there's the judgment uh, of the living nations in Matthew 25. And Peter talks about the judgment of angels. And then, away at the end of time, of course, and we we'll come on this by and by if the Lord spurs us and helps us in the last great final assize, the last great judgment of Revelation chapter 20 called the great white throne judgment. Of course, the great judgment of sin was at the cross where the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood and paid that price that we might have our sins forgiven. So there are many, many judgments in your Bible. This is another one that we're looking at this morning. It's the judgment seat of Christ. Maybe rather called the seat of review. The seat of review. The day of his return is the day of review. The day of review. And we have read those statements, that great uh, basic, that great foundation verse, where the Lord said in, Revelation twenty two twelve. he said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according 
as his work shall be. And then we, wrote, we read in 2 Corinthians 5 about the judgment seat of Christ. And then in the Roman epistle, chapter 14, 10, we read in verse 12 as well, we read that every one of us will give an account of himself to God. And I will have to explain that as we come to it. Now remember that we're in that second great day. Remember we have come through the day of grace and the church period and we spent many weeks looking at that and then we saw how the how the um, scene shifted from earth to, to heaven and the church was raptured home. You remember we saw the church born and the church uh, built and then we saw the church brought home and now the church is at home in heaven. So the next thing that happens of course, is the seat of review. The seat of review. So we're in that second day. It's called the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1 verse 6 says, He that hath begun a good work on you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So the day of Jesus Christ are events in the heavens. And this is one of them that we're looking at, the seat of review, the judgment seat of Christ. Now let's put it in its place prophetically. So immediately after the rapture of the church, we must all stand there before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, seat of reviews may be better because remember it's nothing to do with sin. Our sin was judged at the cross. Please remember that. Psalm 103 verse 12 is a great verse. The psalmist writes, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Glad it didn't say from the north to the south because you measure the distance from the north to the south, but you can't measure the distance from the east to the west. And thus as far as he has removed our transgressions from us. And indeed, one of the great marks of the covenant is mentioned twice in the Hebrew epistle, chapter 8, verse 12, and chapter 10, verse 17. Their sins and iniquities, I will remember them no more. God doesn't forget. He remembers no more. So it's a matter of reward. It's a matter of our service. Please remember this. Let me say this at the start of my remarks this morning. You and I, I'm talking to believers now. Remember, this is for believers. This is not for unbelievers. The great white throne judgment, that last great final assize, is for unbelievers. And you don't want to be at it. You don't want to be at that final great assize because whosoever was not found written in that book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that's the last great final judgment. This is for believers that we're looking at. And please remember, dear fellow believer, that you and I will be in heaven because of what Christ has done for us. Not, nothing of our own works. All right? The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 7 and 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's nothing to do with our works. Nothing to do with our works. You and I will be in heaven because of what Christ has done for us. But my position and your position in the kingdom will be on account of what I or you have done for him. Now, have you got that? Because people don't realize this sometimes. It's a very solemn and serious thing to be a Christian. Very solemn and serious to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's nothing to do with sin. It's a matter of our service. A matter of our service. Now, the great basis then for judgment. Well, we have read it, haven't we? According to works. It's interesting when you go to the book of, he of um, Romans chapter 2. You'll find that there are three great standards of judgment there. You'll find in verse 2 it's according to truth. Of course God's, um, God's judgments are always according to truth. His, his judgments are firm but his judgments are fair. God's judgments are always firm but they're always fair. So his judgments are according to truth. And then verse 6 of Romans chapter 2, according to works. And then verse 16, according to what we have done with the message of the gospel. So remember that this judgment is according to works. According to works. All judgment in your New Testament is according to works. Believers will be judged according to works to determine their place in the kingdom. Unsaved will be judged according to their works to determine a place, their place in the judgment. So the great standard of judgment is according to works. There's a great verse found way back in the book of Ecclesiastes there, chapter 12 and verse 14. In fact, it's the very last verse of that book. The preacher 
it's called Ecclesiastes, and it says this, For God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Mind you, that's a very solemn thing, and it's a very solemn verse. So, the basis for the judgment according to works. What about the judge? Who is the judge? Well, it's quite easy, isn't it? Because when you go back to the room, to um, John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 22, <coughs> the Lord Jesus speaking there, and he says, The Father has committed, the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son. So that's clear, that's crystal, that's firm. And when you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, of course it's called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. But then you say to me, did we not read that verse, Romans 14, 12, where we give an account of ourselves to God? Yes, we did. But then, of course, he is God. Now let me stop for a minute or two and, and do this for, for the younger ones who listen into these lectures on a Sunday morning because it's important because you have to give an answer and you need to have these things in your mind because you're going to meet with these smart Alex who think they know better than God and those who deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't believe that he was God manifest in flesh now let me do this for you and then you'll know when you meet these guys and you'll be able to give an answer to them Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 unto us a child is born unto us a son is given the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now who's the child born and who's the son given? The son was never born. The child was born. It's the Lord Jesus. The son was given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called, listen now, wonderful, counselor. What's the next one? The mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So the child is God. All right, that's Isaiah 9, verse 6. Now come to John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Got it? In the beginning was the Word, <coughs> the Word was with God, the Word was God. Who's the Word? Verse 14 of the chapter. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who is it? It's the Lord Jesus. So John chapter 1, the Word is God. Now one of the most conclusive ones of all, of course, is found in the Hebrew epistle chapter 1. And Hebrews chapter 1 is a very interesting chapter. When the Lord Jesus was on the cross, he spoke three times to the Father. Now there were seven sayings, but three of those sayings were upward to, to his Father. So on the cross... The Son speaks three times to the Father. In Hebrews 1, the Father speaks three times to the Son. And one of those times he says this, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Very important verse. Let me read it and I'll not get it wrong. Then, um, To the angels, he said, they're ministering spirits, a flame of fire. But unto the Son, God saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now that's a very conclusive one, isn't it? The Father speaking to the Son and saying, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Of course, you have that great doxology of Paul's to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.17, where he said, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. And when you come to Revelation chapter 20, of course, in verse 12, who's the one who's sitting on that judgment throne? Who's the judge? It's the Lord Jesus. And all will stand before God. So Isaiah 9, the child is God. John 1, the word is God. Hebrews 1, the son is God. 1 Timothy 1, 17, the king is God. And Revelation 20, the judge is God. So that's conclusive, isn't it? Of course, there's nearly an easier way to do it, you know. Because there are four great first chapters in your New Testament that prove conclusively that Jesus Christ is God. Prove, prove his de deity conclusively. There's John chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1. Just remember first chapters. And you go to any of them and you can prove the deity of the Lord Jesus. John 1, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1 and Revelation chapter 1. Now, moving on quickly. The judgment seat of Christ. Let me say this just as we pass on. Sometimes it's called the Bema. Now, people... 
Preachers talk about the Bema, but they don't explain it. And then people don't know what this word Bema means. B-E-M-A, Bema. What does Bema mean? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what it means this morning, and then you'll have it in your mind for all time, and you'll not be confused. You see, Paul oftentimes takes his illustrations from the great Grecian games at Athens and the great Isthmian games at Corinth. They, they were a yearly uh, event, I think, the Grecian games at Athens was a, a yearly event. I think the, maybe the Isthmian games at Corinth were by annual. I'm not just sure. But there, there they were, second only to our great Olympic games. And, of course, oftentimes in Paul's writings, he takes examples and illustrations from these games because you hear him talking about uh, pressing toward the mark. He's looking for the tape, you know, to, to rest the tape to win the race, pressing toward the mark. And then he talks about running the race and uh, being like the athlete and watching your, your weight and being temperate and all things. So oftentimes, Paul uses these illustrations from these games at Athens and at Corinth. Now, at these games, there was a, a president and he was at the stadium. There was a stadium there and the president sat on a raised platform. There was a platform built, a raised platform. I suppose today we would call it maybe a podium or something like that. But it was a race platform and um, he sat up there and when the runners run the race, the winners came for winning the race or winning the high jump or whatever it was, uh, the games, then that person would come and he would receive his garland, his, his wreath, his garment, garland or his cup or whatever it was. He would receive it from this president who sat up on that race platform. And that race platform was called the place of reward or the bima. So there you have it. The place of reward. Bima means place of reward. And that's where we'll, we'll, we'll not have time to do the rewards this morning, but we'll see maybe next Sunday the rewards. But that's, that's what the, the president, he sat on this raised platform. It was called the bima or the seat of reward. And from here he rewarded the winners. They were called and they got their garlands or their cups or whatever it was, the bima, the seat of reward. So that's, that's what it was, okay? So you know now for all time. Now, the great basis, time's gone on. The great basis for examination. Well, we read it in Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Let me, let me read the verse again. Romans chapter 14 and verse number 12. Because it's a very important verse. Romans 14, 12 says this. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, those four words are important. Here's the basis for examination. Every one of us. John Blanchard in his writings, I like Blanchard, he's very sound. John Blanchard in his writing said this. He said, we'll all pass the judgment seat in single file. Got it? We'll all pass the judgment seat in single file. What was he saying? He was just saying that we'll all give an account of ourselves. Every one of us shall give an account of himself. I'll give an account for myself. You'll give an account for yourself. You'll not give an account for me. I'm sure you're glad. I'll not give an account for you. Every one of us, a personal and individual account, every one of us. You, my friend, believer, will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the Bema, at the Cedar of Review, and you're given account of your life and your service to him. Now, why is that? <coughs> well, we'll deal with this, and then we'll have to probably wrap it up for this morning. Why is that? Well, what happened the night that you trusted the Lord Jesus as your Saviour? Well, you say, you received, I received him. That's right. That's um, John 1, 10 and 11. As many as received him. So you put out that empty hand of faith, and you put it in the nail-pierced hand by faith of the Lord Jesus. And you trusted him and you said, Lord Jesus, I take you as my saviour. You received him. Well, what happened that night? Well, your sins were forgiven. Past, present and future. Doesn't give you a license to sin, no, no. But our sins were forgiven. Their sins and iniquities, I'll remember them no more. But then more, you were brought into God's family. That's a wonderful thing. If God would just have saved us. And forgiven our sins, it would have been wonderful. But we have been adopted into his family. 
Tusha Vash who are saved, who are sons of God. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 15 and 16. But then there's something more serious even than that. Not only were we brought into the family of God, but our bodies became the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We were sealed with that Holy Spirit. Paul writes about that in the Ephesian epistle, of course, in chapter 1 and verse 13. He says there, In whom you also trusted the Lord Jesus, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, upon believing, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So you and I have that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, there's an even more serious verse, and I want to read it to you, because I can quote it, but I don't want to quote it wrong. In First Corinthians chapter 6, and I want you to listen to this very, very carefully. You see, there were things happening at Corinth. The church of Corinth was a very carnal church. And there were things happening there that should never have been happening among believers, among Christians. And Paul writes to them, and he says in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 6, he said, you can look these verses up in your own time and read them. What, do you not know that your body is the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your, in your spirit, which are God's. You got it? Listen, don't read it glibly. Take it in as you read it. Listen to it again. Paul says, your body, Christians, believers, is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. He's in there. He indwells us. First John 4, verse 4, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So our body is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Listen now. You're bought with a price. What's the price? His precious blood shed on the cross. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So this body doesn't belong to me anymore. This body belongs to God. The price was paid for it. What was the price? His precious blood shed on that cross. So, listen to me. So, is it not reasonable? Is it not reasonable that one day he should call me to give an account of the things done in the body. And that's what the seat of review is all about. Now, it took us a good while to get there, but we're there now. So the seat of review, the things done in the body, that's what the bema, that's what the seat of review is always about, is all about. And it's always connected with that day. Always with that day. That is the day of his return. Paul, you remember, in his last will and testimony in two, two uh, Timothy chapter 4, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. We'll come on these crowns next Sunday, all going well. A crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day. So it's the day of review, the place of review. Now we have seen that when we come to our New Testament, there are three lovely figures of the church. Three lovely pictures. First of all, it's a body that will never be dismembered. That's Ephesians chapter 4. And then it's a building that will never be demolished. And then it's a bride that will never be divorced. And in these three, we'll be judged when we stand before the Lord. Now, we can't go much further this morning. A couple of more minutes just to say a couple of things, and then we'll leave it, <coughs> and we'll come back to it next week and finish it next week, all being well. Let me say this. <coughs> Excuse me. We will all come to the judgment seat, to the bema, dressed the same. Every one of us, all dressed the same. Because our Bible says in Isaiah 61 verse 10, we're clothed in garments of salvation and robes of righteousness. Now, we came all different ways. If, if, if you started to tell me how you were saved and went into your background and how the Lord spoke to you, and then I would tell you, it'll be all different. But we all, we all, we all converged and we all came to that same point. We all came to that moment when we realized our sin and our guilt and our need and we put our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus and we had our sins forgiven. So we'll all come to the judgment seat dressed the same. That night we were clothed in garments of salvation and robes of righteousness. Not, not, not our own righteousness. No, no. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, he says, He that is God hath made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we're clothed in his righteousness. So we'll all come to the judgment seat dressed the same. Clothed in garments of salvation, robes of righteousness. 
We'll all leave the judgment seat dressed differently. Every one of us. Why? Because we are weaving down here the garments that we're going to make up. The garments that we're going to wear up there. Now you got that. We're stopping now for this morning. But listen, we are weaving down here in our lives the garments that we're going to wear up there for eternity as we live and reign with Christ. And we're going to be judged and we'll leave it at this this morning and take it up next week. We're going to be judged as how we have laboured in the building, how we have lived in the body, and how we have loved our brothers and sisters in the Lord. So we'll be judged according to that at the seat of review. And then, of course, there are crowns to be won. There's five crowns to be won. Crowns are just rewards. They're not crowns you said on your head. Crowns are rewards. Well, there's, there's five great rewards that we can win when we stand before that bema, that seat of review, and we'll go into them. So we'll take it up where we left off. We'll cover quite a wee bit of ground this morning, uh, laying, the foundation, laying the foundation for it. We'll take it up there next week. We'll see how we have, wonder how we have laboured in the building and how we have lived in, our, in the body and how we have loved our brethren. And we'll look at those five great uh, rewards that are there for us. So that's it. For this morning, we've covered a good wee bit of ground. Hope we haven't went too fast. Look up those verses and read them for yourselves. And we'll come back next week and take the subject up from there. The seat of review, the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Have a good day. Have a good week. And we'll see you next week again. Bye for now.